I would like to start by showing you three images and asking you what you think they have in common. Polar bears stranded on a piece of ice, an Asian chicken market, and an emaciated woman dying of AIDS in Africa. They are all symbols of risks distant from the space of the person perceiving them. When associated with polar regions, climate change is not seen as a direct risk by those outside of polar regions. We talk of German measles, Spanish flu, Asiatic cho um, cholera, polar ice melt, and in doing so, distance the threat from our own personal, physical, and social space. My key point is that we need to look at patterns of public response to a range of risks to know how we are going to respond to the next big thing that comes into the media. I began my journey in this field with research into how AIDS was represented in, this, in South Africa and in Britain at the beginning of the pandemic. I realized that the findings in the two countries and indeed two continents mirrored one another. People distanced the origin of AIDS from their own identities with black Africans seeing it as originating in the West and white Britons seeing it as inherently African. As I studied Ebola, SARS, MRSA, I discovered a pattern that I want to talk to you about today. And this has been corroborated in my more recent work on climate change and earthquakes in highly seismic areas. So I'm going to talk to you today, firstly, about how people represent risks that are on their horizons, why they represent them as they do, and also to talk about whether there are changes afoot in these representations and potentially how they might further change. So, to start, how are risks conceptualized? Well, firstly, as those three images pointed out, they are distant. People represent them as distant from their own space. In this dissociated position, they imagine that others are more vulnerable to the threat. It is morally marginalized, derogated groups that form these others, exemplified in AIDS being associated with sex workers, gay men, and drug users. By focusing on the danger to marginalized groups, members of the public furnish themselves with a sense of immunity from the threat. Related to this is blame. Blame of particular entities for the potential danger. The public response to a host of dangers that are presented to them by the media as being on the horizon is to blame. Blame for misfortune tends to be directed downwards at derogated groups. They are blamed for either bringing the misfortunes upon themselves or for um, causing the misfortune in society. The flip side of blame is stigmatization. People tend to get marked out as figures of social disgrace, either in terms of being associated with the misfortune or being seen to have caused it to be at the genesis of the misfortune. Goffman talks about this having the potential to spoil the identity of the stigmatized. So, in summary, there is an ingrained human response to risk in which it is conceptualized as being out there. Furthermore, there's an attempt to pinpoint the identities of those who will be struck or who, will, who, or who cause the danger, stigmatizing them. This has major consequences. While this pattern leaves those who cast out the blame with a sense of immunity and a sense of lowered anxiety, the consequences are obviously harsh for those who are stigmatized. But it also has consequences for behavior do we wear condoms to protect ourselves against HIV if we are not members of these risk groups? 
Do we choose means of transport that are kind to our environment if climate change is out there affecting only others? Do we prepare ourselves for earthquakes in highly seismic zones if we imagine that it is others who are more at risk of, of um, being affected by earthquakes? The answer, unfortunately, is no, we do not. So I want to turn to thinking about why it is that this pattern of response to danger exists. I think it's an interaction of messages in the media and in the environment around us and their, sh their influence and shaping of how we think and feel about dangers. And this, in this interacts with the self. It interacts with internal, basic human proclivities in which people project blame out onto the other in order to protect themselves from their own anxiety. Set against this backdrop, we had swine flu, a swine flu pandemic in 2009. You notice that the images, these are images from the newspapers, were very different. We're not seeing risk groups. And so I use this to begin to talk about whether this pattern may indeed be changing. This is an age old pattern and it may be changing. Europeans did not associate the swine flu pandemic with risk groups and they actually associated it more with people with suppressed immune systems and with elderly people. So are changes afoot? Well, yes, I think they are. Upward rather than downward blame dominated and was leveled at the World Health Organization for, um, for provoking unjustified fear and at governments for overspending on vaccinations. Holding those in positions of power responsible for dangers seems to have also happened in relation to MRSA or the hospital superbug and also in relation to BSE or mad cow disease. We also see this in people's responses to climate change. There is a lot of talk about scientific conspiracies being at the root of climate change and the emphasis that is placed upon it in society. So it seems to me that there might be a change afoot and that there's less blaming of marginalized groups and more blaming of authority figures. Why might this be? Firstly, I think that probably we're entering a period of risk fatigue. This is a state of exhaustion in members of the public concerning repeated attempts to engage them with the next big threat. People are skeptical regarding the litany of unfounded pronouncements of danger that are projected as being on the horizon. There's a sense that the media exaggerate potential dangers that often turn out to affect only small numbers of people. There's a lack of trust in experts to correctly calibrate the dangers around us. On a more optimistic note, I think there's increasing reflecting, there's an increasing reflexivity in relation to what downward blame and marginalization of certain groups may do to them. So in keeping with trends towards political correctness, there's awareness that lurking dangers tend to get blamed on already marginalized groups with negative consequences for them. And there's an idea that we need to change our representations. We need to change our projection of all of our unwanted fears onto others. So I want to leave you with a sense of what needs to change from the top down. That is mainly in terms of what I'm going to show you in terms of media messages, if this detachment from risk is to end. Now, the following campaign provides a prototype of what the media should not be doing. It's from the early AIDS campaigns in the UK. There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. 
Anyone can get it, man or woman. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. Fear-based media messages are not likely to quell detachment as they evoke anxiety, and it is anxiety that drives this pattern of distancing, blame, and stigmatization. In the vein of more recent messages, an anti-smoking campaign depicts a baby smoking, and it is also unlikely to end the distancing, bl distancing blame stigmatization pattern. This whole shift into disgust from evocation of fear to evocation of disgust, which is quite prominent in our media environment around health issues, is not very useful in terms of the stigmatization of certain groups. It reinforces stigmatization, in this case, of the smoker who causes the death or illness of innocent babies. Well, now an example of really how it should be done. One of the most successful campaigns in history. The Swiss AIDS campaign, the Swiss Stop AIDS campaign, was highly successful and it depicted the very opposite of distancing. This wholesome Swiss girl symbolizes home and homeliness, and she's saying, without a condom, without me. <laughs> so this is, this is a risk being symbolized as here, now, but in a comforting message that does not provoke anxiety or other negative feelings towards the bearers of the risk. This campaign, as I said, has been one of the most successful health campaigns in history. So finally, how can we all increase our own safety behaviors? We can engage with dangers that are presented to lurk on our horizon with awareness that our anxiety may well be sending us along a pathway that tells us, not me, not my group, whatever our actual vulnerability to risk. And with this reflexivity, we might actually do something about the various dangers that exist around us. Thank you.